Joining us now, Mary Trump, former President Donald Trump's niece. She's the host of the Mary Trump Show podcast, author of the book, Too Much and Never Enough. Um, Mary, I haven't had a chance to talk to you since the search at Mar-a-Lago. I feel like you watch the news in a different way than we do. And where we're still capable of shock and horror, you're like, well, of course he did that. Tell, tell me your reaction to learning that he took this material that he had people lie on his behalf about returning it, and he still doesn't want anyone to see what he has. Well, of course he did that. <laughs> that's that's my reaction. Uh, you're absolutely right. There's nothing surprising here, and I think we all need to recalibrate, honestly, and understand uh, everything that Donald has done to date as a prelude to worse things to come. Uh, and if we understand it in those terms, then hopefully we'll stop being surprised and be ready for the worst, but also maybe do everything in our power to prevent the worst. Unfortunately, uh, as as you've been pointing out, there's always there always seems to be one person who owes him a favor or whom he's installed or who is a sycophant willing to put their own reputation and career on the line to enable him even further. I mean, Mary, there's the one person that helps him in the room, at the desk, at the office, but then there are the thousands of Republicans who help greenlight what he's normalized in exception of uh, accepting political violence and acceptance of taking classified documents, which was his own slogan about Hillary Clinton. I mean, the hypocrisy, the, 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 the absence of a spine to stand up to things that, that Republicans would find objectionable in other candidates. Where does all that, where does the ability to do that, to render one of the two political parties corrupt and impotent, where, where does that come Come from? You know, I spend a lot of time, unfortunately, thinking about that very question. And I, I don't think there's a good answer, but it is the continuation of a pattern that has existed for Donald's entire adult life, uh, starting with my grandfather, who was, of course, his chief enabler. I think currently the issue is that Donald has never suffered any accountability for anything he's done. And it looks like some of the crimes he's committed recently are even more serious than crimes he's allegedly committed in the past. So what happens is it, it isn't only Donald who begins to feel impervious uh, or who begins to feel like there is nothing he can't get away with. That also extends to those people who are writing his coattails. And that's where we get to the point where one of our two political parties has become anti-democratic and proto-authoritarian and fascist. So much of what you, I think, have filled in in terms of the blanks um, for me is understanding the length of the patterns. So I've only watched the patterns since he's been a public figure in political life. But you've seen the patterns your whole life, that everything's a lie, that if you scratch, it's all fake, um, that whatever he's accusing someone of doing is what he has done to others. And it's particularly acute when you watch the accusations about the FBI and DOJ. When you look at him as still sitting atop the Republican Party and you think about a second Trump term, what are you afraid of? I'm afraid that that signals the end of the American experiment. I've been saying that for a while. I think you and I spoke about that before the 2020 election. And it's even more true now because we're even farther down the road than we were two years ago. So I don't think we have two years, though. I think we have until November 2022 uh, to make sure that the Democrats retain power in the House and increase their majority in the Senate, because if they don't, then that gives Donald a two-year runway uh, to continue to rig the system in his favor, to for the Republicans to feel completely unbound by any rules or constraints. Uh, so we are running out of time. And I, I wish 
more were being done to help the American people understand that this election is about democracy. It's not about Republicans versus Democrats anymore. Mary, someone who's done a lot to turn the focus on Republicans, using Republicans, is Liz Cheney. And I think the public hearings this summer where she she and, and Benny Chairman Thompson and the members of the committee relied primarily on Republican messengers may have had an impact in turning democracy um, to the top tier issue for voters. But Liz Cheney voted for Trump in 2020. So she I welcome her to the yeah. fight. Um, but 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 she thought he was an acceptable choice to be the country's commander in chief in November. What do you make of how long it takes people to realize how dangerous he is? Well, I think it's because he's useful to them. Uh, Liz Cheney did not object to most of what Donald wanted passed this legislation, or I should say what he was willing to allow in his, his administration. For her, the line was insurrection, which, as you said, good for her, welcome to the fight. But up until then, she was perfectly comfortable with the destruction of voting rights in this country. She's perfectly comfortable with the fact that American women are now second-class citizens and, and cannot have access to adequate health care in more than half of the states in this country. So, you know, her vision of, her definition of democracy is a quite narrow one. And the dangers are much broader than insurrection, which is shocking because that's a pretty dangerous thing, isn't it? But we see the Supreme Court poised right now to continue taking a sledgehammer to the Voting Rights Act, which is just uh, another way in which the Republican Party will be empowered to do away with the few remaining uh, democratic institutions we have. Mary, I know you don't have a crystal ball, but you do um, have more years experience of, of watching Trump and his patterns and the patterns of his enablers. How do you think the Trump story ends? <laughs> um, wow. Well, I, I, I don't know, obviously, uh, with any certainty how it ends, but I can tell you how it should end. It should end with him indicted and convicted and well, adequately punished. Uh, I, I don't know that we'll ever see Donald in prison, but and not just him, all of his enablers. I mean, if, if the if we are to rescue our two party system, if we are, are to set things right, then all of his enablers also need to be held accountable, along with those people in the Senate and House who uh, were perfectly happy to support an insurrection. Um, but we cannot count out the possibility that if Justice doesn't come swiftly enough, and Donald recognizes the danger to be as serious as it actually is. He will run again because he won't have a choice. And if that's if that is allowed to happen, we need to be prepared for even worse than we've seen so far in terms of the incitement of violence, in terms of the co-opting of conspiracy theories, in terms of doing anything in his power to take us down if he thinks he's going down.